of which you would have everyone here. Amen. All right, so we are starting a new sermon series called Vanishing Grace. Uh, it's, uh, it's based off of a book called Vanishing Grace. It looks just like the logo that you saw a little bit ago. And, uh, and so it's by a guy named Philip Yancey. And Philip Yancey um, is, I, I, he, he writes books, uh, you probably maybe have heard one of, one of his books before. It's called What's So Amazing About Grace? That book was really popular in the 90s. It's kind of set him off as this big thing. Some of you are giving me blank stares. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, like that's, remember, we got sin in our life. I got it. I get it. They, uh, no, no, it's, but what's interesting about Philip Yancey is he, he used to be, he's from Atlanta. So he's like me. He lives, he's got Waffle House and Chick-fil-A in his blood. And, uh, and so he's from Atlanta and he got kind of hurt by the church. And kind of had this kind of deconstruction period. That's kind of that kind of happened to him before. Like that became, really became some popular words, and and kind of came back to the faith. And his journey is not so dissimilar from from my own. Um, and so I kind of resonate with a lot of words that he writes. And the book is just filled with stories. And the whole point of it is is. All these stories are to help you grasp of the grace of God. And, and that tagline at the bottom, bringing good news to a deeply divided world. So you don't have to read the book, but you can order it on Amazon. If you do order it, they're cheaper on like the used section. Uh, and you could still get it in a couple days and all, all that stuff. Um, I think this week we'll have like a few that, are, that someone um, had got for us too. So if you, if you would like one, we'll have a few this week. But... But it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a good book. But the, the book kind of asks us to be honest with ourselves about something. And, and it's asking some honest questions. So, like, if you just ask someone out of the blue, like, you know, that isn't part of the church, what, they're like, what do you think of the church? What are they going to tell you? They're like, oh, man, the church, that place is just filled with the love of the Lord, right? Is that what people are going to say? <laughs> like, that's... No, right? Not at all. They're, they're going to they're gonna look at you, maybe get a little angry about it, and, and they're going to say it's full of judgment, arguments, way too into politics, and all these sorts of things that Jesus really was never about. Kind of the point, right? Like that, that's, that's what he had to do. And, and I experienced this in my profession in my daily life because I, as many of you know, I like to talk. It's just what I do, Right? I just talk, 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 talk. And so I like to talk to people, I have conversations, and I will often wait to tell someone into deeper into the conversation before we, I tell them what I do for a living, right? Because soon as the pastor bomb comes out in a new conversation with something, one of two things happen. The first one is the person gets a little too into it, you're like, oh, you're a pastor? That's great. And then it's always like, whoa, like back up. Like they're like way into it. And like they start kissing your feet or something like that. Or they're, they're, they're a little into it and they want you to solve an argument that they disagree with their own pastor on. It's like, can you tell me where you're, my pastor is wrong about this? It's like, it's like easy there, easy. Like I don't, I don't, need, I don't need any of this in my, in my life here. Like all, all that stuff, well, I need to put this thing on some Silent, there we go. And so, so I, I don't need that or the number two. And this is the one that I see the most, that people will immediately shut down the conversation and will try to get out of it because they know what I'm all about. They know I'm gonna judge them and be hard on them. They know that I'm gonna disagree with them things and probably gonna be argumentative and they know exactly how it's gonna go. That's why I wait way into the conversation before I say anything so that I don't, so that I maybe have enough cultural capital with them just a little bit that they'll keep the conversation going, right? Like this isn't something that happens every now and then. This is pretty much every conversation that I have out of here, okay? Like it's just the way it is. And I recognize that, and I have ways, and I'm incredibly charming, <laughs> and I can just get, get things across, right? Like that, that's, but it's, it's you, gotta, you gotta know that, that that's, that's the case, and you deal with it each and every day. 
and is kind of realizing that. But here's the thing, church. It's amazing that we have that reputation. It's warranted that we have that reputation. But the realness of our faith is that God loved us so much that he died and rose again. And in that activity has given you all the grace possible to where it's like on the 23rd Psalm that he says that my cup is overflowing, that our salvation cup, our grace cup, our good news cup is just overflowing out to the brim that because of that, we can just people that are just dispensers of grace all around us. As a church, this is why we have that daycare over there, that Alzheimer's daycare. Because as a group of people, now it's not everybody, it's definitely a subset of the population, but that subset of the population have received a bunch of bad news in their dying, right? That, that you have caregivers of their, of their loved ones that have Alzheimer's that they, they don't know where to turn, they don't know what to do, and they're starting to get sick and tired and just don't know where to go. And they can find out that they can take their loved one there. And, and it's like good news. It's like a cold drink of water on a hot day. That's not the way it was at Legoland on Friday. It's a cold day. No drinks of water were had. But that's like a cold drink of water on a hot day for them. Like that's, the, it was, it's good news. And the reason why we can give that good news to them is because of the, of the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's just overflowing out of us. We can just give them good news. You see it? You see it? Why isn't our reputation that? Well, we're, we're going to talk about that. So one of, my, one of my favorite ways to explain all of this about the good news and grace that God has given us is actually with the, the small catechism, specifically with the Ten Commandments. Now, some of you are like, Ten Commandments? Like, what are you talking about there? Well, I love teaching the Ten Commandments. One of my favorite things to teach, especially the Fifth Commandment. All right, Lutherans. What's the fifth commandment? Look, way to go, head elder. <laughs> like that. <laughs> like that. He said, don't kill. That, that, was, that was said with an authority that did not exist in the first service. There's a lot of people had correct answers in the first service, but it was all given like this. Don't <laughs> matter. Like, like that's, they were all said like, so like with just no confidence, right? But it's, I love talking about the fifth commandment, which is do not murder, right? Do not kill. Because that's the one we, we usually get right off on the list. We're like, yep, I haven't killed anybody. And like, er, yet. <laughs> like, and then, and then we did all, all those things. Like, wait, wait, that's, that's kind of what we do with it. But the thing is, when you look at the catechism of Luther, and you need to understand something about the catechism, especially the large catechism. Look, reading the large catechism in my life changed my perspective. I used to be a man that was, a, was about all the rules. You got to do all this in order for God to save you and all that stuff. I wouldn't say that. Oh yeah, no, it's my grace you've been saved. But all my actions said you got to do all these things. And, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and I read Luther's large catechism and it just filled my heart with grace. And I began to see it. I began, I was like, oh, there it is. And what you see in the, in the talking about the fifth commandment is that Luther is talking about something and he's quoting Jesus. And Jesus says that what you're thinking about in your heart is actually what's going on with that killing. It's not about the physical activity. It is about the physical activity. But it's also what's going on in your heart. So when we say things like, you're dead to me, we're actually meaning it, right? Like that's, and it's over there. And, and we see that even in that, that we don't have clean enough lives to save ourselves. Yet God, knowing all those sins, still offers us grace and good news. Filling us up so that we can just give good news to other people by having the daycare, by being a part of the things that you guys are a part of. We're able to do that. One of the ways I like to teach it, I can't remember if I talked about it with DJ and Katie, I guarantee they don't remember because I'm so interesting, right, guys? Yeah, see? But uh, I like to t talk about it with um, these little jokes type of thing. So let, let's, these are terrible jokes, 
but they're meant to teach. All right, you ready? So I want you to name this guy, all right? There's a guy, he doesn't have any arms, and he doesn't have any legs. What are you guys laughing at? They don't have any arms, and he doesn't have any legs, yet he likes to swim. What is his name? Good job, Bob. All right, <laughs> like over there. Don't laugh at it, it's a bad joke. What's a guy that doesn't have any arms or legs and likes to play in a pile of leaves? Russell, Russell. Don't laugh at those, are terrible jokes. But we know the, the whole teaching behind the fifth commandment is, is, and we can understand it by having Bob. That if we had Bob without any arms or legs, and that he was face down, eating even a small amount of water, and he's at a risk of drowning. And if, and if you, you walked past him, and were like, oh, that's, that's, that's a shame, and you just continued walking, like, you're participating in that murder. You could just easily turn him over, right? And if you saw someone from a distance, just walk, see someone in that plight, and someone didn't just turn over, like, that's a bad person. Like, how, how dare how dare they not, not turn that over? That's also an idea that's in, like making sure our neighbors are okay. But then what would you think about a person like this that would walk up to him and go, and go, hey, Bob, you need to turn around, buddy. You need to turn around or you're not gonna be able to breathe. Oh my goodness. You need to turn your life around right now so that you can breathe that, that sweet breath of God. You know? And by telling you this, Bob, I'm showing you love. Now, that's an easy straw man example that I just gave. But it says something. If only you could turn over. If only you could breathe that life in. You're choosing to be face down there. And we probably wouldn't like that person that much, right? I think this is that, those are the people that are outside the church that they see of us. A lot of times. And I think we would judge a lot of times equally in similar situations. This is where I want to talk about the gospel lesson today. Love this story. As you guys know, I love all, apparently love all the stories in the Bible because I say it all the time. But I love this story about the Samaritan woman at the well because of what she says about Jesus. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But I love it because of that. But the Samaritan woman at the well, there's two things wrong with her. There's two things wrong with her. The first one is that she is a Samaritan. Boo hiss, right? Now, we all know that the, the Jews didn't like the Samaritans. Do you know why they didn't like the Samaritans? No. Like, that's, no, like it's, it's, it's not really taught, which I, I, I don't think people really know it. So we're going to get into why, why they didn't, didn't actually like the Samaritans. So you remember how Israel was taken in by Babylon, the Babylonian captivity? They were taken into Babylon, and, and Babylon took most of the Israelites, the Jews, out of Israel and out of Jerusalem and took them up into Babylon. All right, you remember that? They would purposely leave people behind. All right? The reason why, it would create division later. They would leave people behind. And because what would happen is, there wasn't enough people left behind to support all the infrastructure. There wouldn't be enough people behind to actually make sure that they were all in safety and can be in security. They, they would leave them behind basically like worthless and penniless and couldn't do anything. So what did those people do? They would intermarry with the other people around just for their own safety and for their own well-being, right? Listen to me. This is a little offshoot of this. If so, it, Babylon and just con, read about conquering people, they would leave people behind to sow division later. If you are getting mad at somebody because they have different politics than you, because they have different things than you, if they have different, they look different than you, or anything like that, realize that it's maybe a little manufactured by someone else to get you to hate them. Throw it away. Love, you know, love all people, okay? So, so they would manufacture that. So here's what happened a few generations later. Babylon released 
the Israelites, the Jews, to go back to, and they allowed them to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild their city, to rebuild the walls in the city and rebuild the temple. This is the story that's found in Nehemiah, okay? In that book, Nehemiah. Rebuilding all those walls, and they come back. And those people that we call the Samaritans, remember they inter, inter, intermarried and all that stuff, they see them, they're like, our people are back. Let's rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And they come back to Jerusalem. And do you know how those Jews treated them? They're like, you are half-breeds. You intermarried with other people. Get out of our sight. Oh, no wonder there's hate there. Right? By the way, that's straight-up racism. That's like eugenics words I can't say here in good company. You know? Like, that's what that is. By the way, Jeremiah told the people that were in captivity to Babylon to intermarry, and they refused. They're the ones being, mm, gets me upset. And so, and then think about it. You can tell that it's not the way of God because how does Jesus talk about righteousness in that story of the Good Samaritan? He's pointing out it's all hypocrisy, none of that stuff. And I'm telling you, do you have any of those feelings towards other people that are like that? Push them down. Get them out. It's like a cancer. Get them out. This is what this story is about. So she's a Samaritan. The next problem is she's coming in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day. Now, I grew up in Texas. I didn't grow up in Texas. I grew up in Atlanta. I vickered in Texas. There's the words I'm trying to use. I'm a public speaker. I, I vickered in Texas. That's just a fancy word as I'm, I interned in Texas. And I was in South Texas. Like South Texas, like four hours south of San Antonio, South Texas, right? I was on the border of Mexico. And I was there like a month, and I started realizing that there was a trend. Because it's hot down there. It's like desert down there type of thing. And I would be walking around, and, and, and all of a sudden, about like one o'clock in the afternoon, there would not be a soul anywhere. No one on the roads, no one in the grocery stores. I found out if I wanted to go to the grocery store, two o'clock in the afternoon was the time. It was like, it was dead. You know, there's no one in there. But what, what would happen is, as it started cooling off, people would start showing up. I've never seen a Walmart with a Walmart or H-E-B, if you're from Texas, right guys? H-E-B. There's a lot of Texas idolatry in the H-E-B. The pretzels are in the shape of Texas. Lots of like, ooh, you know? Like, I'm surprised Publix doesn't have Florida-shaped stuff. But we're not as deep into it as, as Texas is. But, but I would go to H-E-B like at 10 o'clock at night, all the reg registers going, like all this stuff. But during the day, because it was so hot, everyone's like, I'm not working out there. I'll work later, right? It's like that now with this lady. So in the middle of the day, why is she going and getting water in the middle of the day? Because she doesn't want to deal with any, any of the other ladies in the town. Because she has real issues that she's been through. That she's been real, I mean, she's had five husbands. And the man she's with now isn't her husband at all. Like, you got to put your eyes into her life. She has no existence out of husbands. What kind of pain and hurt has she gone through that, has, that she's had five husbands? right? Not to mention all of the judgment that comes from all these other ladies, right, whose lives are clean. And so she comes in there, and Jesus is sitting there. And Jesus is sitting there, and she's like, oh my goodness. And, and he starts talking almost in riddles about drinks of cold water on a hot day. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give them will never be thirsty again. The water that I give them will, will be in a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And immediately after this, she's like, I want this water. That sounds great. But then she's like, you must be a prophet. Like, like you must be a prophet about what you're talking about, all these things. Like, where's the true place that we should worship? Like, it's like those people coming to me and wanting to solve problems, right? Like, where, where's it at? And notice Jesus doesn't take the bait. Instead, instead of further dividing, Jesus then 
in all the wisdom of the Creator, comes and brings together. Watch, watch how he does this. We fast forward a few verses. And he says, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. However, the hour is coming and is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. Like Jesus has such a profound effect on her that she runs to the town. And this is why I love this story right here. You ready? The woman left her water jar. She went to the town and said, come, see a man who told me everything that I ever did. And she's happy about it. Now, if you guys came to me and told me everything that I'd ever did, I would like, who's been telling secrets? <laughs> right? I wouldn't be happy about it. Like, like, like what do you, what's going, like, what, what do you want? You're blackmailing me? Like, like that's, like, what, what's, what's happening, right? And yet, with Jesus on that hot day, came to her, where she wanted to just be alone and be away from it all, he knew everything and yet never stopped giving her grace. He knew everything and never stopped giving her love. He knows everything about all of us and yet, and that singular point of the cross, even though he knew it all, he comes and he died for us all, all of our sins so that we all may have life. He knows every little nitty gritty thing and this is just the pattern of God that through all out history that he's constantly bringing grace and he brings it to her and she's like, he knew everything. He still showed me all that grace and love and told everyone about it. One of the stories that Philip Yancey uses in the book is about a guy named Christopher Hitchens. Have you guys ever heard about Christopher Hitchens? Really famous atheist. Christians really didn't like him very much because he was always kind of disproving things and arguing and all, the, all that stuff. Well, Christopher Hitchens actually got throat cancer and he, uh, and he ended up dying. And Vanity Fair actually did kind of an expose on, on him and his doctor. And one of the things that when uh, it kind of came out that Christopher Hitchens had throat cancer, he got all these nasty letters from Christians. One of which was especially nasty. It said, because of your lion throat is why you got throat cancer. Right? But Christopher Hitchens, man of wealth and you know, acclaim and all that, had one of the best doctors in, in the country. And that doctor was a Christian. And he provided care and grace to him. Now there wasn't any deathbed conversion. There wasn't any, anything, it's like part of that story like that. But we know because of that doctor's testimony that he showed the grace of God to Christopher Hitchens. And we can let God worry about the rest. Our verse in Hebrews says this, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. See to it that no one fails to see the grace of God. Because you don't want that bitterness to get in deep. You don't want it to be like Esau who lost out on the blessing and he just gets angry and goes on a murderous rage. We well, don't want that. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. Instead, we need to be like Pez dispensers. I mean... We need to be like grace dispensers. Dispensers of God's grace, realizing that we have been filled up to overflowing and we can simply just give out the grace and love to the people around us and let Jesus work out the rest. Because that's what we have been shown. Church, we are shown so much grace and love by God and have been filled up to overflowing and we can send that overflowing and pour it out everywhere that we go. And we'll end right there. And we'll say a prayer. Jesus, we thank you that you love us and that you're with us. Lord, guide us in all the ways of watching us, that we may be wells of grace, that we be these grace dispensers, that we could 
see people around us, and rather than judging them, we could see how you have judged us and still show us love and grace just as you show them. Thank you, Jesus, for, um, for being with us. Amen. And I just want to say thanks for um, supporting the church here. That, that, like Kevin was talking about, you know, it's been three years since we broke ground.